The narrative we often listen to says we are powerless to overcome life's obstacles, that we are destined for defeat. But scripture tells us a different story. As Romans 8 and 9 fearlessly declare, we aren't just conquerors, we are more than conquerors through Jesus. Discover what it means to be more than a conqueror. I'm so excited about this new sermon series. We're gonna, going to do a sermon series on Romans chapter 8 and chapter 9. And these are such rich theological chapters in God's Word. In fact, I've heard people say Romans 8 is my favorite chapter in the Bible. And if you've ever read parts of, of Romans 8, and I'm sure you've heard or have quoted the end of Romans 8, Romans 8, 28, maybe even misquoted it as it happens sometimes. But there is so much in Romans chapter 8 and chapter 9, and we're going to discuss some of that. It is rich theology. It is full of assurance. It is full of hope living hope that we just sang about. The name of this series is More Than Conquerors, a phrase right out of Romans chapter 8. So much in our world tells us that we aren't overcomers, that we are defeated by the things of this world, by our challenges and our struggles and our flaws. And yet scripture tells us that we aren't just conquerors, we don't just have victory, we are more than conquerors. That is a message of hope. That is a message of assurance. And I'm excited for us to, to dive into God's word over the next five or six weeks and see what God has to say for us. As we do often when we start a new series, we have Discovery Bible Study bookmarks. These are out in the lobby. You can actually pick up a cardboard bookmark, or if you want a virtual bookmark, you can go on our website and find that there under the media tab. This is a great resource. People sometimes say, I want to I want to study the Bible. I want to know more of God's Word. I don't know really where to start. And daily reading is a great thing to do, and we encourage that here, and I hope that you're doing that. But also, it's helpful to open up God's Word with other people, maybe with friends or family, maybe if you're in a men's group or a women's group, or maybe you're trying to influence someone at work or someone at school, or maybe it's someone in your Bible class here, or just someone in your circle of influence. Sit down, open the Bible, and then, okay, now what? We read a passage. Well, this Bible study walks you through some very simple questions. I say they're simple because when you first look at them, you think, well, those are simple. But they get straight to the point. What does this text say about God, his will for our lives, who he is, his nature, his heart? What does it say about us as humans? How do we find our place in this story that we're reading in the text? And then it helps you apply these things to your life. So I recommend that as a great resource. If you have a Bible, I would encourage you to open it up to Romans chapter 8. That's going to be our text today, the first part of Romans chapter 8. And especially today, I think it's going to be helpful because it is so, what's the word, dense. There's so much rich theology in there. It kind of helps having the text in front of you so you can kind of make your way through it and you can kind of see some of the links and ties together that we're going to point out. So we're going to be in Romans chapter 8. Most of us know the feeling. We call it guilt. Most of us know what it's like to feel guilty. Maybe we've done something we shouldn't have done. Maybe we broke the rules or we, we were speeding down the highway and we see the flashing lights. We know what it's like to feel guilty, and that is an awful feeling, isn't it? No one likes that feeling. We know what it's like to dread what's coming next, especially when we've been caught or called out for doing something wrong, right? Called to the principal's office, or the teacher gets on to us, or our parents get on to us, or we know that punishment is coming. And there is nothing more dreadful than the guilt and the anticipation of punishment. I remember when I was about 10 or 11 years old, my parents were away from the house for the day, and so my older brother and I had this great idea Let's play football in the living room. Seemed like a great idea. But don't worry, we weren't mindless barbarians. We had rules set up for safety and to protect the furniture. One rule was we're going to use a Nerf football, not a real football. See, that's, that's already smart. We're using a Nerf football. It's just a big sponge. The other rule was you can't run or stand on your feet. We had to play from our knees. Our living room was tiny. It wasn't very big at all, so we... We, scoot back, we scooted back the, uh, 
the footstool and, and as much of the furniture as we could, and that was our football field, and we got after it. We were having a good time. We were sweating. I mean, you know, we're basically wrestling, and, and things were going well until one of us, details are still a little sketchy on, as to who it was, one of us tossed the Nerf football, and it grazed the edge of the light fixture in the living room. In this living room, we had two very simple light fixtures, a decorative chain hanging down from the ceiling with a light bulb surrounded by an oval-shaped glass, very pretty etched glass globe. Well, the football sort of glancing blow against one of these light globes, and you know how when people say something traumatic is happening that all of a sudden it goes into slow motion? That's what happened. This light began to teeter as we looked up, and then it finally released. That glass globe released, and it came towering down onto the seat, the edge of the seat of my dad's recliner, and it did not break. We couldn't believe it. We're watching that, and we can't get there in time, and then it crawls over the front edge of the recliner and tumbles to the floor where it shatters into a thousand pieces. Oh, it was bad. What do we do? Well, the first thing we did was start blaming each other. Why did you throw that? You should have caught that. You did that. And then we decided, you know what? We need to stick together on this. We need to come up with a plan. So here was our plan. Our plan was to clean up the glass as much as possible, throw that away, don't say a word about it, and maybe when our parents get home, they will not notice. After all, who really looks at the ceiling when you go into a room, right? And if it's days or weeks, then we can find something else to blame it on. That was our big plan. It did not work. Evidently, my mom likes to look at the ceiling when she comes into a house. So it took her about 10 seconds to notice what had happened. But I remember that feeling. I remember waiting on them to get home. I remember the guilt. You know, we broke the rules. We're not supposed to play ball in the house. I remember dreading the punishment that was going to come. I didn't know what it was going to be. I knew it was not going to be good. And I remember that awful feeling of guilt and dread. Some of you know what that feeling is like on a larger scale. Some people live with that constant feeling of guilt and dread. Like a cloud hanging over their heads. It's just always there. And maybe there are moments and glimpses of light and hope, but largely it's just dread and guilt. And I know some of us here today, maybe some of us grew up that way. That was, that was what we heard at church. There wasn't a lot of grace being taught or preached growing up. And we got a steady diet of guilt and you better do the right thing. And if you don't do the right thing, here's what's going to happen to you. Maybe you've walked around all of these years under that cloud of dread and guilt. I'm here to tell you that that's not God's intention. God has a different life in store for you. An abundant life. A life of peace and joy. A comedian once said that all religions are the same, that religion is guilt just with different holidays. <laughs> you see, the world thinks that's what religion is. The world thinks that's what Christianity is. You just come and, and you get beat over the head for all the things that you do wrong, and you're told to leave here and go out in the world and don't mess up, because if you do, God is going to zap you. You know one of the things that makes Christianity different from every other religion? It is not about guilt. At the heart of Christianity is freedom and grace. Freedom and grace. And maybe some of you need to hear that today. Maybe that's the message you need to take with you. That Jesus, that God is about freedom and grace. One of Paul's main reasons for writing Romans, inspired by the Holy Spirit, commissioned by God to write this letter, this book we call Romans, one of his main purposes was to instill in those first century Christians, and by extension us, an assurance, a security 
a sense of resolve that says, I am with Christ, and if I am with Christ, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. We don't have to live in fear for the punishment that is coming because we are less than perfect. We don't have to walk under that cloud of dread and judgment. God wants you to know that you can live with a sense of assurance. So in the first seven chapters of Romans, Paul is making his case. And his case is, here is the gospel, the good news of Jesus. He says, there is a just and a holy God. He says, there are humans, all of us, people, who are sinful. We choose to sin. And we live in a world plagued by sin and death. And judgment is looming. Judgment is coming for all of humanity. But God sent a perfect Savior, Paul says. Jesus, who lived, who died as a sacrifice for our sins, who was resurrected. And because of that, Paul says, we are, he uses the word, justified. That's a Bible word for saying, you are made right with God. You see, if we're on our own in our sin, we are unholy. How can something unholy defile something that is holy and that is God? You can't. Something has to take that sin away. And Paul says, Jesus has done that for you. And then as he opens up chapter 8, of course he's not writing chapter 8. We put those numbers and divisions in there. But as he is getting to the next point, it is the bottom line. After the first seven chapters, Romans 8 verse 1 is the bottom line. It is the main point. It is the summary of all that he has said. Romans 8 verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Therefore, because of all of these things we just said, Romans 1 through 7, a just and a holy God, sinful man, plagued world by sin and death, perfect sacrifice, resurrection, justification. Therefore, because of all of that, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Can we amen that? We need to amen that. Not just with our words, but with the way we live our lives. Not as condemned people, but as people who are secure in Jesus Christ. You see, some of us continue to live under a cloud of condemnation. That's what happens when we live in fear because of a steady diet of thinking our salvation depends upon us. What I do, what I don't do. There are others who approach other people with a posture of condemnation. Because the idea of being called out, that's what the church is, being called out is distorted into being called to judge the world. Rather than called out from the world, sometimes we see it as called to judge the world. Others are targeted by condemnation. Where that person's perspective, that person's life, is scrutinized, criticized, condemned by those who often choose to stand on the high moral ground. Why would someone say that religion is about guilt? Because all too often that is the message. But what Romans chapter 8 verse 1 makes very clear is that if you are in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation. You don't have to live in fear. You don't have to lug around this burden of guilt that says you are less than, that you aren't good enough, that you haven't done enough, that you don't know enough. You don't have to dread the impending punishment. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that is why authentic followers of Jesus, those who choose to live a life in Christ, they should be, we should be some of the most joyful, grateful, peaceful, pleasant people on this planet. But why is there no condemnation? That's a fair question. 
If there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, why? Paul answers the question. Keep reading. In fact, look how he starts in verse 2. Because, why is there no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus? Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. There's a lot going on there. I said these chapters are rich in theology and here we have this atonement theology. We're going to be dipping our feet into the deep end of the pool in some of this series. So let's sort of break this down into different parts and talk about what Paul is really saying here. First of all, he says, through Christ Jesus. Remember before in verse 1, it was in Christ Jesus. No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now he says, through Christ Jesus. Jesus makes it possible. There's no other way. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit sets us free from the law of sin and death. Through Jesus, the law of the Spirit sets us free from the law of sin and death. Well, is he talking about the old law, the Ten Commandments, the Mosaic law? Well, I think he's going to in the next verse, but I think here he's talking about something a little bit different, not a code of rules, but a law in the sense of a controlling power, a controlling force, a controlling principle. Here I have a pen. What happens if I drop this pen? It falls to the floor, just like that light did <laughs> when I was a kid. And we call that the law of gravity, right? Very good. The law of gravity. That is a controlling force, a controlling principle. The law of sin and death is something that we all must deal with. It's a force inside of me and you that puts self at the center of the universe. It doesn't take long for us to live before we start to give in to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. In other words, we sin. We are sinners. And the law of sin and death says that sin ultimately leads to death. And not just physical death, but death in the sense of separation from God. God is life. Death is separation from life, separation from God. So the law of sin and death is this controlling force, this controlling principle that impacts all of us because we are sinners and our sin leads to death, separation from God. But there's another law, the law of the Spirit he talks about, and it supersedes, it counteracts the law of sin and death. Just like the law of gravity in essence, can be superseded or counteracted or neutralized by the law of lift, the law of thrust, the law of aerodynamics, my son tells me. Just as the law of gravity can be neutralized by these other laws so that a 200-ton chunk of metal can fly through the air and not just fall straight down, the law of the Spirit can neutralize, if that's the right word, can supersede the law of sin and death, so that the result is that we have life, that we aren't separated from God who is life, but that we have life, that we are with God. So Paul talks about these two laws that are at work. And then in verse 3, I think he does talk about the law, the Mosaic law. It couldn't provide what it was intended to provide, and that is life. Why? Was it inadequate? Was it inferior? Was it not a good law? Did God mess up somehow when he gave the law to Moses? No, it wasn't the law. Paul tells us what the problem was. He says it was weakened by the flesh. What does that mean? It means that we as fallible humans could not keep the law perfectly because we are sinners, because we do mess up. 
Well, like any good law, the old law, the Mosaic law, had consequences. When you break a law, there are consequences. When you play football in the house and break something, there are consequences. When you get in your car and you speed down the road and you get caught, there are consequences. There is punishment. But also in the old law, there were, there were sacrifices. There were offerings to try to take away some of the sin. And it's that context, it's with that image that Paul presents Jesus. He has taken the punishment for us. He has become that sacrifice, that sin offering for us to fulfill the law. I like what N.T. Wright says quite plainly. God condemned sin in the flesh. He cornered it and condemned it. As the prophet has said, the punishment that brought us peace fell upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. Quoting Isaiah. I like that phrase. He cornered it and condemned it. Picture the cross. At Calvary, God cornered sin and he condemned it. He did not condemn Jesus, the sinless one, but as Jesus took on our sins, he condemned that sin in the flesh, the life, the body of Jesus. Your sin was condemned at the cross, so you don't have to live as one who is condemned. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. God wants you to live not with condemnation, but with conviction. You see, there's a difference. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, that godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. Guilt that promotes a culture of legalism and condemnation is different than godly sorrow that produces confession and conviction. One leads to constant fear, living in fear. The other leads to repentance and transformation, change. And that's what Paul says as he continues in chapter 8. He says, when you are in Christ, Christ begins to change you. The Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, works from the inside out and brings transformation in your life. Continue in chapter 8, verse 5. Those who living, live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. That's an important word, peace. Not living in fear, not being condemned, not living, toting that guilt around, but living in peace, peace with God and peace with others. Verse 7, the mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You say, well, okay, I get that. How do I know if I'm living according to the flesh or I'm living according to the Spirit? Well, just look at your life. Take an honest look into your heart, into your mind. What's important to you? What are you pursuing in life? What do you hold as, as the greatest values of your life? Are they the things of God's kingdom or are they the, are they the things of the world? The things of the flesh, to use his term. Self. Surrendering your life to Christ. Surrendering your life to Christ produces a different life, a new life, a new way of life. That's what he says. Transformation happens. You no longer have this mind that thinks about the things of the world and pursues those things. Are you perfect? No. Being in Christ doesn't make you perfect. It lets you share in his perfection. But your mind begins to change. Your heart, your life begin to change. They begin to be transformed by the Spirit working in you so that you don't pursue the things of the world, you pursue the things of God. Those become your values. Those become your way of life. And that isn't a way of life that says, look, God, don't I deserve not to have condemnation? Don't I deserve no punishment? Don't I deserve? Look how good I am. Look how much I know. Look how I've... No. Look at how Paul presents this. This transformation is a result of, it is a response 
to being in Christ and having this spirit of life in us that changes us. Like someone said, if your religion hasn't changed you, maybe it's time to change your religion. As we look at Romans 8, we see Jesus, the one who God sent. Who God sent as this atoning sacrifice. The one who took on our sins, sins that were condemned, so that we don't have to be condemned. What a great time for us to pause and to remember the death of Jesus. To remember the significance of what Jesus has done at the cross. So we want to commune together. We do this every Sunday. It's a great opportunity for us to be reminded. In the context of community, the one thing that brings us together, different stories, different backgrounds, different people, but brought together by a common faith and a knowledge and a belief and a conviction that Jesus lived and he died for us. Romans says you don't have to live with a sense of guilt. Jesus has removed that because of the grace of God, the love and obedience of Jesus. So as we participate in communion together, we will pause to remember, just as Jesus told us to. We will reflect with grateful hearts on the joy that comes with being not condemned, but set free from the law of sin and death. We're going to sing a song, and then I'll come back up and lead us in a prayer for the bread. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you pay. Bearing all my sin.
Let's join together and pray over the bread. Father God, we recognize that you are worthy. You alone are worthy. Father, as we look at you in humility and we look at ourselves, we see how unworthy we are. But God, we also see how much you love us, that you wanted to rescue us, save us, forgive us. Father, we know that the death of Jesus makes that possible. And so as we partake of this bread, the body of Christ, may we remember the body that hung on the cross. May we remember the body that we are called to be the body of Christ. May we remember and reflect and proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Father, we are grateful. We are so thankful for your love and mercy, for taking the punishment from us. Bless us as we remember together today. In Jesus' name, amen. After the prayer for the cup in just a moment, we are going to make a subtle yet profound shift. It's it's the same shift that Paul makes in Romans chapter 8. After talking about the death and the sacrifice of Jesus, he shifts to the resurrection of Jesus. You see, as much as Jesus' death takes away our sins, it's the resurrection that infuses the crucifixion with power. Otherwise, Jesus is just a guy, a guy who talked a good talk and was killed because he caused some trouble. It was his resurrection that infused what he did at the cross with power. So we want to not only remember his death, but we want to celebrate his resurrection. And so right after you drink the cup, you're going to see on the screen some sights and you're going to hear some sounds taking you back to what that moment might have looked like, just to to get your mind in that space to make the transition from the suffering at the cross to the glory of the resurrection. And then we'll come back and see what Paul says about that resurrection and what it means for us. Let's bow together and pray over the cup. Father God, we thank you for the blood that Jesus shed for us. We don't know how it all works, but we know that you allowed that blood to cleanse us from our sins. The sins that separate us from you, the sin sin that causes us death. Father, we are thankful. We are so dependent upon Jesus. Help us to remember that as we remember him. Help us to recall his suffering, but also celebrate his life his resurrection. Father, we remember as we partake of this cup together. Bless us in Jesus' name. Amen.
He has risen, just as he said he would, just as God had planned, just as Scripture prophesied, just as the world witnessed this undeniable demonstration of power that validates everything Jesus said and did, including his death. The resurrection changes everything, everything. So notice what Paul says as we continue in Romans chapter 8, verse 9. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, remember what he said earlier, those who are in Christ. Now he says, if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness, the righteousness of Jesus. And look at verse 11. Here it is. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit who lives in you. Just as the power of God raised Jesus from the tomb, that same power will raise you up someday to live eternally. Throughout these 11 verses, Paul has contrasted spirit and flesh, life and death. And he says, your physical body, it is subject to death. You're going to die. Your body is going to wear out. Some of us know that as we get older and older, it's starting to happen. Your body is going to wear out and you're going to die. And if you die apart from Christ, not in Christ, that death separates you from God for all of eternity. But the Spirit, he says, gives life, not death, life. And if the Spirit of God is living in you, that same power that raised Christ will raise you up and give you life, eternal life. As one author wrote, the incarnation means Jesus became like us. The resurrection means we will become like him. But to share in that resurrection, we must be in Christ. Go back to verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are, what? In Christ. And so the obvious question is, okay, what does that mean to be in Christ? What does that look like? What is he talking about? Think about it this way. You are either in Adam or you are in Christ. You are either in Adam, of Adam, or in and of Christ. Some of you have done ancestral studies, the DNA, and you find out your genealogy. Some of you have done that. I, I haven't. I'm a little nervous about what I might find out about my family. But some of you have done that, and it's interesting. You find out sort of your origins. You find out where you came from, some of your family history, and it kind of explains some things and puts some pieces together, and that's good. When you go to the website for Ancestry.com, it says, every family has a story. Every family has a story, and that's true. We all know that. So what is the story of your family, not just your physical family, but back out a little bit, a macro view. You are either in the family of Adam or you are in the family of God that is with Christ. And that family has a story that impacts you. You are in that story, of that story. Paul says it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, for since death came through a man, that's Adam, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man, that's Christ, For as in Adam all die, there's that phrase, in Adam. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. In Adam is simply Scripture's way of saying you are on your own. You are part of the human race. You are subject to this this compelling force, this not law of gravity, law of sin and death. Which means if you are in Adam, you are apart from Christ. You are not in the family of God. You are on your own. That force, that power, that principle, sin and death, will be your destiny. You will die in your sins. 
that will lead to death, which is separation from God. However, if you have the law of the Spirit to supersede, to counteract the law of sin and death, you will be alive. Just as Jesus was alive when that stone was rolled away, just when those angels said, why do you seek the living among the dead? You will be alive for eternity. Paul tells us what that means in Galatians 3, verse 27. So in Christ Jesus, there's that phrase, in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. You are in the family of God. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. All of us begin in Adam, but it's your choice as to whether or not you are in Christ. People say, well, you can't choose your family. God lets you choose his family. In fact, you have to choose his family. He doesn't force you. He doesn't make you. It's your choice. But recognizing who he is and what he has done, why would you not choose Jesus? Why would you not choose to be in Christ? To be clothed with Christ? A few years ago in North Dallas, a police officer pulled over a 25-year-old man named Hayden Carlo, because his registration had expired. He pulled him over, and the officer went up and talked to the young man, and he said, you, you know, I pulled you over because your registration's expired, and the young man said, I know. I, I knew that it was. He said, we have really fallen on hard times. He said, I literally had to choose between updating my registration or feeding my children. And the officer listened to him, and then he walked back to his car for a few minutes, and then he came back up, and he gave Carlo a folded ticket, a citation. He said, have a good day. And the officer left. Carlo was disappointed, as most of us would be. He was discouraged, and he looked down, and he opened up that citation, and inside the paper was a crisp $100 bill. The officer had put it there. Enough money to cover the registration and the reduced fee for taking care of it so quickly. You see, the law has consequences. There is punishment for breaking the law. God is a just God. God is holy, and sin cannot enter into his presence. There is punishment for sin, but God is also merciful and loving. And just as he is just, he gives us what we need to take care of the punishment. He sent Jesus to take care of the punishment. The punishment that brings us peace, peace with God, was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We are set free. We can live with no condemnation. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Are you in Christ Jesus? If not, it's time. It's time to embrace Jesus as your Savior. To confess to others that I believe he is who he said he was. That he lived, that he died, that he was resurrected. To be baptized into Christ. To let God raise you out of the water with the Holy Spirit in you transforming your life, setting your mind on things above, not on things below. Being in the family of God. Being in Christ. Do that today. If we can encourage you and pray for you, let us do that. A couple of our shepherds and their wives will be in the parlor. It's a room right behind the stage area. You can go there. They will encourage you and pray for you. Or you can come down to the front, and we'd be happy to do that as well. If there's something we can do, we invite you to come as we stand and sing. Let's stand.